Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Kate Brown. Um, this is Nicola Schaefer. We are co-chairs of the Watlington Climate Action Group. Um, now, I don't normally write a formal introduction, um, but because there's quite a lot of you and we've got a lot of speakers, I wanted to make sure I introduce everybody properly. Um, hello, are you Nigel? Yes, great. Um, <laughs> set the scene for the meeting. Brilliant. Sorry for starting early. Um, we'll start by hearing from our five expert speakers, um, and we'll then spend some time in discussion groups to identify what the most important things are that we've learned, and how we can use those things to create a green plan for Watlington. Um, I'm also delighted to welcome Robert Barber, who's the chair of Watlington Environment Group. He'll be giving us a short introduction first um, to his group's activities and how we might all work together to create the Green Plan. Um, there are two key aims for the Green Plan. The first is to support and grow our local carbon sinks, and the second is to protect and enhance our local biodiversity to enable it to be more resilient to future climate stresses. There's currently a lot of interest and activity within climate action groups around tree planting. You might have noticed this. Um, but in Watlington, we really are blessed with a big variety of different habitats, all of which provide valuable carbon sinks and a huge array of biodiversity, actually. So we need to make sure that the efforts we make in the Green Plan are the right choices to support our local biodiverse habitats. Now, each of our speakers, and we have five of them, thank you all um, for coming tonight. Um, I'm sure everyone could speak individually for an hour or two on their specialist areas if we asked them to. Um, but we didn't do that. We wanted to hear from as wide a range of speakers as possible to demonstrate the variety of biodiversity in and around Wellington. Um, our speakers will also be leading the discussion groups later on, so there'll be an opportunity later in the evening for you to ask them questions if you'd like to do that later. So we're not going to take questions whilst presentations are going on because they're only 10 minutes each. But first, some background. Um, to tackle the climate crisis, we need to do two things. The first is reduce emissions, and the second is to support nature's carbon sinks to remove those emissions. Um, the Watlington Climate Action Group, since we started last year, has focused its efforts so far on engaging people in our community to reduce their emissions um, by encouraging behaviour change, to reduce consumption, minimise waste, recycling, um, etc. Some of our future, fro future projects will focus more on perhaps home energy efficiency, transport and a repair cafe. Some of these changes will be led by us as individuals, changing how often we fly, where we shop, our dietary choices perhaps, um, and some of them um, will be driven by infrastructure development, that confused me, um, and new technologies, especially, for example, the electrification of transport and heating for new homes. Um, all of these changes will be necessary to reduce emissions, but we also need to remove emissions that are already there. And that's where um, carbon sinks come in. So carbon sinks are in the land, they're in the oceans, and they're all very important. Nature plays a really vital role, absorbing and storing greenhouse gases through chemical and biological processes. Human activities can support carbon sinks, and many habitat-related climate solutions have a double benefit of both reducing emissions and absorbing carbon simultaneously. Now, there are many different habitats and green spaces in and around Watlington, from gardens and brooks, through grasslands and woodlands, to hedgerows, plain fields and farmland. So tonight we're going to hear from five different experts on these different habitats and what we can do to support and improve these natural carbon sinks. I'll introduce our experts very briefly now and then later on in more detail when they each come up to speak. So first of all we have Matt Bond, um, who's our national trust, our local national trust ranger. He's going to be talking to us about the Chilterns chalk grasslands. Um, Robin Harmon was unfortunately not able to join us, so Ian Naismith has stepped in. Um, he'll be talking about ponds and waterways. Stuart the wild man, Mabbott, um, will be talking to us about wildlife gardening. Um, Nigel Adams um, will be talking about hedgerows and how vital they are for biodiverse, local biodiversity. And last but not least, Martin Gammy will be talking about the importance of trees. Um, thank you all for coming along. Thank you to everyone in the audience. I hope we have a good evening. Um, I'm going to um, introduce you all in more detail later, but first let me hand you over to Robert from the Wattington Environment Group. First of all, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. And um, I've been asked, I've been tasked with talking briefly, very briefly, so I'm going to have to fly through this, on two subjects. One is actually Wellington Environment Group, and then a very broad um, um, covering of, on biodiversity. Um, I'm delighted that uh, we have actually managed to get our, ourselves coordinated, because the, the Climate Action Group obviously initially started very much as a separate organisation, and then we have this huge areas of overlap mm -hmm. and I'm delighted that we are now getting our act together and working working together and to that extent it's, it's brilliant that biodiversity has now reached mm -hmm. the top of, of the climate action um, agenda for you guys. 
So, if we make a start with the Environment Group. Many of you will know about the Environment Group. Some of you are here I know are members. But um, for the benefit of those who aren't, um, I've been asked just to fly through what the group is and what it does. So, it's going to be a bit of jumping up and down. We are officially a voluntary association of local people. And you have to have a sort of official term or else you can't get funding. Is it that one? Our aims. No, actually, go on. Come on in a little bit. Self-explanatory. Wildlife and environmental issues. That's really the core of it and has been from the beginning. Um, but specifically with, with a local agenda. In other words, um, climate change affects Watlington. Um, grass, chalk grassland on the hill affects Watlington. Tigers don't unless they're released on a reintroduction programme, in which case we'll deal with that when we get to it. So, so we, we've always been involved very much with the local. That's right. Um, survey, record and monitor the local flora and fauna. We've done a fair bit of that, not perhaps as much as we should, so maybe that's something that we will you know, work together. Yes? Right, concerned that the natural environment and encouraged biodiversity, that's exactly what this is, this is about um, um, to that extent. Next. That's straightforward. Next, we're getting through this. This is how we do it. Go on. Hold on. First of all, the meet, speaker meetings. Um, we've had a huge range of speakers. We did. I did work it out once. It's basically, it's it's, it's sort of it's hundreds. It's, it's God knows how. It's at least at least a couple of hundred on a huge range of subjects. But as I say, they're all always focused on on local issues. Um, or issues that affect us locally. Um, and then visits to nature reserves, other places of environmental interest. For example, we've been to the Didcot Power Station, we've been to the rubbish recycling centres, all, all manner of things. We have a newsletter. Oh yeah, don't forget, oh, yes, nature reserves, we missed that. Um, and and um, nature walks, which you know, anyone is welcome to join in with. Newsletter every month to tell everyone what's going on. And practical conservation work in the parish. Yes. So yep. that's been one of our key things. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Chalk Pits Local Nature Reserve. Hopefully, quite a few of you. We've managed it for about um, over 20 years now, on behalf of the parish council. We got it designated as a, as a nature reserve in the, in the first place, and that is ongoing. And in fact, maybe one of the sites that we, we talk about next. Ha. Huh. Himalayan balsam, it's interesting, we, we spend a lot of time, it seems like, removing things. This is a horrendously invasive plant through the woodlands. Um, if you read the books, they'll say it's a river plant, but there's tens of acres of it in, in, in the woods. Uh, or there was, there were tens of acres, because we, we've eradicated it from the National Trust woods, um, and the Forestry Commission woods, and we're, we're working on Watlington Park. Next. Now, I put this in because this is actually the first task we did, and we haven't done any of this for a very long time. But a, a gentleman called Peter Hutchins, who many of you will remember, actually planted something like a thousand trees on the verges of Watlington in the 1990s. And, and having planted them, he did no follow up whatsoever. So we did, um, we did a lot of work on that, and that's maybe relevant to other things we do in the future. Yeah. Miscellaneous other tasks. Yeah. And we also offer. Advice, five minutes. Thank you, Keith. Advice on wildlife issues to, um, to, to residents. Next. Two key projects recently. The watercourses project. I shall say nothing, but Ian will talk to you about that. The next one. Toad patrol. We just started a toad patrol. There's a, um, we found a place up on the top road near, at Greenfield where loads of toads are crossing. Um, up until last night, we've just had a peak the last two nights. We've saved, in the last three days, 350 toads. Sadly, 60 have been squashed, but that's, that's at least half, you know, um, I think of those 350 probably would have gone. Next. And there we are, entertaining um, um, activity for all. Next. Next. Da -da. Da -da, that's it. Now, I've been having a five minute warning, so we need to fly on. Next. Biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Biodiversity ground, da, da, da. that's what the UN says, but actually if you think about it, it's just life on Earth. It, it, and so what can we do to maintain the biodiversity we've got and you know, hopefully improve it? Hold on. Go on. <laughs> Go on. 
go on. <laughs> it's all about habitat. Next. So, in terms of the project of the green, green what, in what habitats? I'm going to fly through these because time is short. Some of these will be covered by the speakers. Woodland, obviously, tons and tons of woodland up on the top, incredibly rich, fantastic carbon sink, a resource of all, all sorts of species from the, from the highest to the lowest. Next. Grassland. Matt will tell you about grassland. Next. Scrub. Very important. Everyone, we spend most of our life cutting it, but it has a very important function. Hedges. Leave that to Nigel. But the, but the key thing is it links the linear and the link everything together. Cool. Individual trees. I'm sure Martin will mention that. Be able to think that individual trees actually have a slightly different function from, from woodland. It's only got no wood in the middle of the town, but you've got an individual tree which can do a great job. The brooks and streams, which Ian will tell you about. Ponds, which Ian will also tell you about. Arable land, that's the tricky one, because that's what most of the land is. And then you've got to influence the farmers, who are actually making a living out of that land. It's their factory. So we want to mess with their factory. That's a tricky, tricky proposition. Road verges, fantastic resource. It's heavily polluted by traffic, but people don't generally walk much there. So it's a, it's, it's a bit of sort of wasteland, but actually it's like a giant nature reserve. Buildings themselves, we've got swifts nesting in the high street. There are things that grow on the walls. Half of you have got, probably you've got woodworm as well. And it supports all sorts of life. Next. Hard landscapes, they're usually mostly negative, um, but they can, can have certain, certain attributes. And, um, and if you think of even a pavement, you think of a tree, in a sense, the pavement over it is kind of like a mulch. It's a nasty mulch, but it's still a mulch, which is how the trees survive. And last but not least, because this is what can, is going to be the easiest thing to, to attack by the good folk of Watlington, is gardens. Most, many of you have got gardens, and there, you, you, you know, we really have got control. Right. So, all of these can play a role. Mm -hmm. So let's make it happen. Thanks. <laughs> I'm Matt Bond, uh, Ranger for Wallington Hill. We've got a laser here. Wallington Hill, we've got the town over here. And I'm here to talk to you about chalk grassland in the Chilterns. There are over 700 hectares of chalk grassland in the Chilterns AOMB, which is a fair old chunk of land, um, not to be scoffed at. Um, so, as the name suggests, um, you're not going to get chalk grassland growing on anything else other than chalk. So we've got very chalky soils, um, which you can see here. Um, obviously, this is um, a dramatised kind of example. It's the white mark. It's got lots of crushed chalk on it. So nothing looks quite as chalky as that, but you've got the idea. So we've got very um, low nutrient levels in the in the chalk, um, and therefore um, the plants that grow on there are very specialised at dealing with that. Um, you've got very kind of free draining soils and lots of nutrient leaching going on. Um, so any nutrient in there is going to be going pretty, pretty quick and therefore only certain things can tolerate those conditions. Um, it's a habitat formed by intervention, a plagioclimax community. So basically that means that through human intervention um, we have um, halted vegetation succession and um, basically stopped grassland from turning into woodland, hence all the scrub cutting that we do on chalk grassland. So here are basically us, our influence there, cattle, grazing, causing, um, halting of vegetation succession. So managing chalk grassland, pretty much, you can call it pretty much cutting or, or eating, but there's different forms. Um, brush cutting, a bit of tractor mowing, uh, tree popping has been the latest craze on Watlington Hill. Um, we've done a lot of that. Um, and lots of cutting and, and raking and removing nutrients and then grazing, of course. No grazing on Watlington Hill. This is one of our other short grassland sites, Hume Hill. Um, yeah, so grasslands, their potential for carbon storage. Uh, grassland soils have the highest carbon stock of any UK habitat. So they're, they're pretty pretty good. Um, they obviously differ to woodland, um, obviously it's grass, not a tree, um, but they store their carbon underground, not above ground in, in carbon, timber. Um, so in theory, 
they may be more resilient to climate change. So obviously that's something that we're quite worried about day to day. But in drought scenarios, which is what this comment is mostly focusing on, if you did have a wildfire, um, you'd, all the grass would get burnt off the top, but a lot of the carbon will still be locked in the ground and safe or safer rather than being burnt as a, as a tree would be. So high diversity grasslands are up to 500% better at storing carbon. So sounds great, right? I mean, have some, have some diversity. And especially with chalk grassland being incredibly diverse and having up to 40 species per square metre, um, we're looking at some pretty diverse grasslands on our doorstep. Grazing. So I put this in because obviously if you're managing chalk grassland, you're going to be potentially grazing it. Um, how does this affect kind of carbon storage and carbon output? If you're grazing it, um, the cattle or the sheep are going to be emitters of carbon, so you're not doing any real favours there as far as carbon goes. And then scrub cutting and mowing. In theory, it's not that great for carbon storage, unfortunately, because you're removing vegetation um, and removing that carbon store. So, yeah, unfortunately, it's something that needs to be done, but may not be the best for carbon storage. So, threats to storing carbon. These are things that are going to limit the um, ability of storing carbon in grassland. Um, changing from unimproved to arable grassland. Um, fortunately, this is something that will probably never happen to Watkins and Hill, it's protected by the National Trust, but it is something that happens elsewhere. So you're going from a diverse grassland to a monoculture, which will not be particularly good for storing carbon. Um, as we said, diverse grasslands are good and non-diverse aren't. Um, erosion and disturbance. If you ever expose soil, you're um, letting the air get to the soil and decompose the organic matter, um, which releases carbon into the atmosphere. So yeah, any erosion will not be doing us any favours. Overgrazing, um, plants that are being overgrazed are not going to be particularly happy and therefore they're not going to be depositing lots of carbon into the ground. So this is the, this is the nice slide. This is a bit of chalk grassland biodiversity. Um, I'll quickly run through what we've got. We've got Duke of Burgundy here. Unfortunately, we don't have this at Watkinson. It's the wrong habitat, but it's a, a great kind of chalk grassland plant. Uh, we've got wild candy stuff here, which is well known at Watkinson. It's one of the reasons it's designated a triple SI. Adonis blue, um, bee orchids, a bit of broom rape here, viper's bugoss, and here we have a little silver spotted skipper hiding in a dogwood leaf. So, perfect example that scrub is great for biodiversity. So, Watkinson and Burton Hill designated triple SI. So, it's some of the more floristically diverse grassland in the Chilterns. Um, home to the nationally rare species wild candy stuff, as we saw in previous slides. It's a stronghold for a healthy population of silver spotted skippers, which is this little guy here, um, which is really good and it continues to be year on year. So, obviously, something's going on there that's, that's good for them. And it's got exceptional bryophyte and lichen flora. So, some examples here. Um, and one location on the hill has got upwards of kind of 50. Um, liverwort species in one spot, so quite amazing. A mosaic habitat. So aerial view of the hill here, um, you can tell that it's not just grassland. We've got um, scrub, open areas, and that's, that's what you want. You don't just want a blanket of grassland, you want diversity, which is what nature does best. You want open areas, oh, sorry, open areas and different heights, so low scrub, High scrub, um, tall grass, short grass, glades, you want those niches for um, all those species that we, that we want to have. Threats to biodiversity, um, fragmentation and island populations. Unfortunately, a lot of our sites in the Chilterns um, with short grasslands are not well connected. It's often a road or woodland or a farmer's field in the way of joining up our sites. So you have island populations which as you may know, are not particularly resilient to change. You've got all your eggs in one basket and you've got a dwindling gene pool for animals and plants. So they're not particularly, well, they're not in the best shape potentially. Scrub, been talking a lot about scrub. Um, too much, 
is not good. Too little is not good, but you want that kind of perfect amount. Some people say it might be 25% on short grassland, but if, um, yeah, it's a definitely a threat. If you, if you blink, it's everywhere. Uh, nutrient enrichment, definitely something that's um, a problem on Watlington Hill. Um, lots of dog poo, and um, yeah, you're effectively changing the, the soil and all these specialist species that like the low nutrients and short grassland are not going to be particularly happy if you're putting compost or um, manure on, on them. So yeah. And climate change. This is another funny one. So drought, everyone thinks, oh that's that's a disaster, it, like that's going to really affect short grassland. But in theory we've already got an environment or a landscape that is pretty resilient. You've got very free draining soils that um, in the summer do get incredibly dry. Um, you've got a lot of, um, lot of heat as well. If you imagine the, the south slopes of short grassland getting blasted by the sun all day and you, you very rarely see them in too bad a shape. So I like to think that they're quite resilient and we might be okay if we have warming up of um, yeah, the climate. Take home messages. Um, we've got some amazing habitats on our doorstep. Um, Wallington Hill um, throughout the year is absolutely amazing, as are all the other short grassland sites in, in the Chilterns. Um, short grassland definitely does play a significant part in carbon storage, so um, that's good to know. It's a fragile landscape. As I said, we've got a lot of isolated sites. Um, it's not particularly resilient to change. It doesn't take much um, neglect or um, damaging operations to really impact your site. Scrub is a part of the mosaic and it's an integral part of short grassland. Um, as I said, lots of people have a very negative opinion of that and I think it's quite historic, but um, it's definitely good providing you get the right balance. And conservation charities like the National Trust are definitely key to preserving habitats like these. Um, I don't know who else would be doing it if we weren't doing it. So, um, yeah, thank you for your support. And, yeah. About 6,000 years ago, somebody sat on what was my allot is now my allotment and chipped these stone fragments off a piece of flint that he was working on to make tools. That person would have gazed out upon a post-glacial landscape that was before all of these human activities that uh, we're meeting tonight to talk about. But what's the link between somebody 6,000 years ago and us sitting here in this building now? The reason is that for about half a mile around us there's a series of natural chalk springs that come to the surface and they provide the water that that guy needed and the reason why this village is here. It's actually also the reason why all the other villages around here are located where they are, below the Chilton Spring Line. So Lutner, Sherburn, Perton, Watlington, Ribble Salome, Brightwell Baldwin, Cooks and Cookson are all on springs. That's the entire reason why they are there. That's why the population is down here and not up in the Chilterns where it is dry. They're also all linked together because those springs give rise to a series of watercourses. Here in Watlington, at Stone Green, we've got the source of the Childgrove Brook. The Chargrove Brook runs down through Cookson, out through Chargrove to Stadhampton, where it joins onto the River Tame and the whole River Tame catchment. Perton Brook joins in just above Cookson. The Brightwell, the Brickwell Saloon Brook joins in above Cookson. The streams from Sherburn and from Lucna both come together at Cut Mill just down below Cookson, and the Brightwell Baldwin stream joins and goes on through there. So we are in a sort of a linked landscape here. What is special as well about this is um, their chalk streams. And 70% of the world's chalk streams are here in England. There's a lot in France as well, but very little around the rest of the world. So it's the Lincolnshire Walls, it's down here through the Chilterns, the Cotswolds, the North Downs, the South Downs. And what is unique about them is that they are provided that the water source is fairly constant. Coming from chalk, the spring water is cool, because it is fairly constant, it is clean, and it results in certain types of species uh, being able to colonize there. Another thing about chalk streams is they dry up. So quite a lot of what we've got that lives in our chalk streams is adapted 
to dry years and can mm. re reappear mm. quite quickly. Some of these little organisms can go deep down in the gravels. So, what have we got here in Watlington itself? It's worth just bearing in mind. So I mentioned the horse pond here, the source of the main brook. Now we don't see the brook, it's underneath Brook Street. Sometime between about 1600 and about the mid 1800s it was buried in a brick culvert. And you see it occasionally, you can see it now because it's popping up through gratings in the road because of the water table is so high. We've got a series of other ponds, uh, like the, the Willow Pond, it's probably the one you know most of, artificially made. But, so there's springs here, springs here. There's springs all around the church, on the far side of the church. There's a spring in the allotments. In fact, there's a water course which used to run where the school is, which is now buried underneath the school. Um, what the, the Willow Pond connects into the Gogs. And then even down below the roundabout, out on the Cookson Road, just up above the Watlington Mill, there's still further springs which provided some of the water supply for, the, for, the, for those. And over here I've got Britwell Saloon Street, just comes into the edge of the parish. Now one thing to bear in mind with the Watlington Environment Group is we only work within the parish. So we're interested in the water courses here. We've got a bit of the Perton Brook, we've got the Watlington Sewage Treatment Works within the parish, and we've got a bit of the Britwell Saloon Brook. Let's just move on as well. Um, apart from the streams we know, if you put your mind back to 2013, when we last had a lot of rainfall, and we're moving towards that situation at the moment. We had a very high water table, and we had a load of other streams. The ones marked in red here appeared. So, uh, if you remember, Hill Road is a bit of a stream. A spring came out in the field just above the carriers, and was flowing down through the carriers' car park. And there's flooding down towards the bottom of Hill Road here. There's a stream which sort of appears across this field. Up above the, uh, this brook here, there was um, up the pond, there was another brook. And then all sorts of things started rising out in the fields here. So it's, a, it's, it's quite a dynamic situation we have here with regards to water. If we look at the, um, the sort of geology of the aquifers, this is a sort of cross-section through. So here's Watlington Hill. Here would, this would be the white mark. Down here is Watlington. And down here, sort of Cookson, Stoke Talmage Ridge. So the rain falls, it goes down through all these chalk layers. There's something called the Tottenhoe Stone just here, which actually brings it to the surface. So water goes down, also fills up, and it comes out here at Watlington. Five minutes left. So, one of the things I also want to just mention to you is it's on a slope. Everything in Watlington goes downhill, which does mean it's not really a natural place of having wetlands. What does happen, uh, this is just to further illustrate what happens with the water, of course, is there's the Willow Pond last summer, there's the Willow Pond now. That was all we had last year. It's all because the water table got so low just before Christmas, but it's now it's increased tremendously. These water courses have a lot of biodiversity. Plants, <coughs> vertebrates, and the trout. Now, if you want to protect uh, the jungle, you, protect, you, you get people to pay for the uh, tiger. If you want to protect the rainforest, you get them interested in orangutans. If you want to protect chalk streams, you get them interested in brown trout. We're lucky to have brown trout in Watlington, and they need very uh, sort of optimal habitats, oxygenated water, good quality, cool, cover from predators, abundant food, good loose ground for spawning, good nursery areas, and pools where the larger fish can live. Um, this is what a bit of the stream by the Watlington, by the church looks like. Got a lot of nice gravelly cobbles. However, it's too wide and too shallow, so there was a need to do a lot of work. And so a big focus for the Watlington Environment Group um, has been improving habitat and access to spawning. We actually have good spawning areas around here. So here's just an example down below the roundabout where a bit of work was done uh, to just improve making a pool narrowing the stream, putting in new gravel to create good habitat. And we've been doing a lot of that all the way down the brook. However, unfortunately as well, apart from our lovely clean natural water, also all the runoff from Watlington goes into the stream. So it can turn into a raging brook. Unfortunately, if frogs or toads ever um, uh, they spawn in it, they all get washed away. So um, sadly, because it's also interconnected, we also have things like fish kills. We spend a lot of time trying to protect the trout, 
and this was a couple of years ago, when somebody put a small quantity of something toxic into a road drain in Mottlington, and it killed the trout, so we had to protect for that. Uh, so we try to spend a fair amount of time raising awareness through various events. What about ponds? <coughs> we recently started looking at the ponds, particularly because of um, toads and frogs. But the thing about ponds is they do add to biodiversity and they can be good carbon sinks. But they're only good carbon sinks if they are left to accumulate sediments. And those sediments now, unfortunately, therefore means that our big ponds, like the willow pond, it dries up each summer, it actually releases carbon from, from, from the bottom. So the ponds that really matter in one are the ones in your gardens. As particularly if they are left to accumulate, there's a potential there that they could be carbon sinks. And uh, we don't need to bother with the detail of this slide, but there's a, an indication of where some of those are, and this was something we produced looking at where we knew those frogs spawn and toads spawn. So these ponds potentially are not only a, any uh, source of biodiversity, they could be somewhere where you personally in your garden could create a carbon sink. And um, with regards to frogs and toads, most of the time that's where they're breeding in Washington. Apart from, of course, those few up on the top of the hill there, which I haven't got time to talk about them now. Looking forward here in Watlington on the pond front, we have all this new development going on, but there are a number of ponds, sustainable drainage systems, which are being anticipated. So here's the church, here's the roundabout, here's the stream down below, here's the, uh, the stream running down through here. So there's potentially some new ponds which will be created there. Gats of the future, where are we with the Watlington Environment Group Watercourses project now? We're continuing with our historical research. We want to understand the watercourses better. Daylighting. A lot of what's in Watlington streams are buried underground. If we hadn't buried them, we would have had something like that nice stream that you see down in Cookson would be running down Brook Street. So where there are opportunities, we want to see daylighting, and there's some work going on down with the church to re-daylight part of it. Landscape scale enhancement is what we're now thinking about, linking things together. There's some opportunities along the Perton Brook to create a sort of biodiversity corridor. Raising awareness at the schools, I'm talking there in two weeks' time about all of this. And we're trying to influence, the, we've influenced the Washington plan, we're influencing new development, and we are working with yourselves, the Climate Action Group. I want to put a photograph up of the new development down by the church where the two houses are. The original plans for that, the architect said, the drainage ditch, which runs past the site, would be incorporated into the gardens. If you do go down there, the, dra the, the natural chalk stream is not in the gardens, and there's a buffer strip there now, which we made sure was installed. And the toad crossing has been mentioned. I'd like to mention Oxford Arch Art Week. There's going to be a large model of a trout, and there's going to be a red kite and various other things. But the trout is all about um, raising awareness of the water crisis. <coughs> And finally, um, we can't operate without all the organisations we work with. So when we're thinking about what can we do here in Watlington, we have the River Tain Conservation Trust that we work with, the Wild Trout Trust, the Environment Agency, Thames Water is extremely helpful towards us, and not to mention Babylon Plants, who keep providing us with plants and materials for our enhancements in the stream. Thank you very much. <laughs> need 10 minutes because uh, I basically want to talk about uh, your awareness of what's already out here, uh, what you're walking past on a daily basis and can you actually really make a difference. I'm going to throw a statement at you and I want you to think about this. There are more people alive on this planet now than have ever died in history. So we have the man and the woman power to make a difference. There's more people alive now than have ever died in history. I want you to think about your role in the ecosystem in your gardens, locally and a little bit wider in Oxfordshire. I want you to think about when you're out there gardening, when you put something in, what difference is that making to the food chain? What unseen difference? What unseen benefit? What unseen negative? And what impact are you going to have by taking something away? So when you're out there gardening, just think, what impact am I really having? 
I want to work your minds differently. I want you to see your gardens as many nature reserves linked up with all the other gardens nearby. You said just now we're in a linked up country, habitat, environment. All these talks are linked, so there's similar themes running through. All your gardens are linked, all of them. Wildlife gardening is not about doing nothing. Doing too little is as bad as doing too much. Which is your awareness, just think. If you're a manicurist, fine, you can be a wildlife gardener like that. If you're a manicurist, you're probably going to grow a lot of perennial plants. They grow each year, they flower, and then you cut them down, and then they grow again next year. If you want to be an instant wildlife gardener, in November, when you cut them down, you leave the stems about that long. Three reasons. One, when it snows, you'll remember where your plants are. Two, when it's cold, it will protect the plants from the frost. And three, you've attracted all the insects in the previous summer. Where well, are they going to hibernate? They're going to hibernate in those hollow stems that you leave that long. And they're probably going to be the predators of what you consider pests next year. So you've attracted them. How are you going to keep them to come back? Then in March, about this time, you can cut those stems straight down to the ground. You're a wildlife gardener. And you can be a manicurist as well. It's fine. If you've got a few apple trees, leave some apples on the ground. Let them rot. Not too many because you're going to trip over them. But in November, you're going to see butterflies like the red admirals. They're going to be on the rotting apples going for the sugar because they hibernate and come back in spring. So just leave a few apples on the ground. You're a wildlife gardener. A wildlife garden doesn't have to look that much different to a manicured. There are only a handful of things you have to do, and it's about diversity. Different plants, different coloured plants, different types of shapes, times of year. Grasses of a different length, short grass, long grass, moderate length grass. Ponds, water, an upturned dustbin lid, and dead wood. They're the only four things you really need to bring into your garden to make a difference. This is happening on Watlington Hill, this is happening by your streams. They're the four component parts. And most people have got those four already. Your wildlife gardens. So, we can make a difference. Now, if you go onto your computer and use something like Google Earth, look at your property from above. See how it's linked with all the other areas. If you've got a hedge at the bottom of your garden, you'll begin to notice that your neighbour's got part of the hedge as well, and it just goes all around the community. That's what the nature is going to use to navigate around. These island habitats, you don't have to have them in gardens because you're all linked. But it's not all about doing it all in your garden. In most gardens are quite small. Just pick aspects. Now, do you all live in a house? Anybody live in a bungalow here? I'm the only one who lives in a bungalow. <laughs> okay, so you all live in a house. What I want you to do tomorrow, the first task, is to go upstairs into your bedroom window and have a look out and see what your neighbours are doing. <laughs> and then do something different, but complementary. You might be able to not even use Google Earth. You just look out there and see what your neighbours are doing and just... Okay, I can bring that into my garden. I was doing some work in Watling, not Watlington, Yarnton. I'm in Watlington, I wasn't doing some work in Watlington. I was doing some work in Yarnton. Went out into this back garden and all these other houses. You can see the other gardens and five minutes. I might need ten. <laughs> and um, this woman said, I want to have a wildlife garden. All the other gardens had tall trees, shrubs. And I said, you need to have like an open grassland. Yours is like a woodland glade. If I'd have gone in there and her, her garden was, all the neighbours were open gardens with mown grass, I said, you need to be the small woodland to just have a thing. When you go for a walk tomorrow, uh, walk around the village, think, well, is there any nature around? Yes, we're losing the ability to see it. Go for a walk tomorrow, somewhere you always go, take a camera with you and try and take some photographs of the nature on that walk, and it'll begin to make you realise what's already there. There is nature there. Nature is struggling, but we're struggling to even notice what's left. 
if you go into your garden tomorrow, have a listen. Have a listen to the birds that are around you. Now, anybody know what this species of bird is? Great tit, any others? Cold tit. It's a great tit. Okay, these are everywhere. And if you go out there now, well not now, but they're sleeping, uh, you, all might, you might hear, this is where I use up my two minutes, you might hear this, one more, great tip. Now I was working with an Oxford University student a little while ago and she said the great tit core looks like fur cones. <laughs> so uh, with the tit family, they will all, great tits have got about 47 different cores. But in the tit family they will always do, choose a tune, they will repeat it, have a break, repeat it, have a break. So go out there. Is it repeated? Is it having a break? Repeated, break? It's probably in the tit family. 47 calls the great tit. If you, if so, you're walking down the road and nobody knows what it is, just say it's a great tit. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, you say, well, I don't really know what the birds are, and it, oh, it affects my enjoyment of it. Just enjoy it for what it is. It's a bird singing. But with a great tit, if you try and maybe associate memories with certain sounds. And when I listen to this, it reminds me of my granddad. Because there's three, two things I used to like doing as a child. I grew up in uh, Marsh Bolden, not too far away. First thing, he used to saw up wood for the house fire. I used to like uh, uh, filling up the wheelbarrow, pushing the wheelbarrow, a massive great wheelbarrow. It wasn't massive, I was little, but it was. <laughs> and the second thing I used to like doing was sleeping in the wood store. And I, I used to say to him, Grandad, this uh, sounds like a squeaky wheelbarrow wheel. This great tip. That's how the wheelbarrow used to sound. And I said, Grandad, why don't you oil the wheel? And he'd say, well, if, how do I know if you're sleeping or working? <laughs> so when you're out there, if you don't know what it is, don't let that affect your your enjoyment of it. Don't that affect you to say, well, I'm not even going to bother trying. Is it going to make a difference? There are more people alive now than have ever died. One minute. I didn't need my ten minutes. So just have a think of that. Can you make a difference? Can this meeting tonight make a difference? There are more people alive now than have ever died. Not all in this room. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I personally believe hedgerows kind of define our landscape in many, many ways. We're surrounded by them, or we certainly should be. If you actually bunch together all the hedgerows in our country into one, if you could magically bunch them all together, it would be by far the largest national park in the country. Um, we have two main types of hedgerow in our, in our country. One is the sort of higgledy-piggledy small farm systems of the, what we call the ancient countryside, very often mixed species hedges, and often land where they cleared woodland to form the fields. Yeah. And we have a second type, generalising when I say two types, there are others, but the second main type is the enclosure hedges, planted between uh, 1750 and about 1860. Almost all uh, consist of 100% hawthorn. And I think in our parish we kind of have both. We certainly on the, on the lowland down here have these enclosure hedges, very, very straight hedges, uh, all hawthorn, and then as you get to the top of the hills and down in the valleys, that's where you see the, the ancient species rich hedges. I think the hawthorn prob uh, what the hedges are actually the ones which are most problematic today. Very quickly about hedgerow loss, between uh, 1945 and 1984 it's estimated there was a 50% loss in the hedgerows in this country. So in 1984, there were 624,000 kilometres of a managed hedge. By that, I mean not hedgerows that have turned to trees, but managed hedge. So you can tell what was there before. And that was really because farmers were being paid to remove them as part of the drive towards uh, greater food production. 
Uh, that, it, it decreased again to 506,000 kilometres in 1990. In 1997, we had a hedgerow protection uh, law was passed, which seemed to halt the loss of uh, hedgerows. You had to ask permission to, um, you were allowed if it didn't pass certain criteria, you at least had to ask permission. So that kind of, um, it increased slightly to 508,000 kilometres in 98, showing that that had worked. But in the last countryside survey, countryside surveys used to take place every 10 years, looking at absolutely everything in the countryside, the hedgerows had dropped again to 477,000 kilometres. I think the main reasons for this is, that, oh, don't forget we're looking at what we call managed hedges. These hedges have become now, they've been, the ones that are neglected have turned into lines of trees and are no longer counted as hedges. And the uh, over-trimmed hedges have uh, become relic hedges. They've become so gappy that they're not actually um, registered as hedges. This is the over-managed hedge. This is the over-trimmed hedge. These hedges have been trimmed at the same height probably since the 1960s, and they literally cannot stand that kind of regime. The stems are trying to get bigger. The, the, uh, the growth goes up, and it's kind of this mushroom effect. This is just down by Chinna. This hedge is, is pretty well going to disappear. It's got elderberry invading it. And it's an unviable hedge in, in my, my point of view. This is one down in the turn of Turbo Valley. It's been trimmed at the same height for all these years, and indeed the stock are now getting underneath it. This is, you'll recognise this as the white mark up there. This hedge, I know all my life as you drive down into Watkinson, I see it running perpendicular from Hill Road. It's fading away completely and no longer viable as a hedge, in my opinion. It gets worse every year. And yet, in the bottom of it, we see signs of old hedge laying. That tells me that that hedge once had lots and lots of stems. It was la laid and formed a thick, dense hedge, but it's fading away. This hedge was probably planted exactly the same time as that previous hedge, except this has been neglected. And this hedge is now getting old and decrepit. And again, really no longer viable as a hedge, only good for uh, pigeons and, and maybe magpies. There's quite a few of these type around Watkinson. I have to inform you, in my opinion, the hedgerows around Watkinson are not very good at all. There's lots of them, all looking like this. Even to cut them down and, and plant up, you know, cut them to coppice them to ground level and plant up the gaps, these stems are probably not viable anymore. This is up by Damley's Farm, covered in ivy, which we know is great for nature, but it, it's beyond hedge laying, it's, it's got too big, it's been neglected and it's turning into a line of trees. So that last two th countryside survey in 2007 showed that 48% of managed hedges in the country were in good structural condition when certain criteria were applied to them. 31% of managed hedges were in good structural condition and had appropriately managed margins <coughs> next to them. But in arable areas, only 12% of hedges were in good structural condition. This might be what we could, could consider to be a really lively, vibrant hedge. It's not being trimmed hard every year. It's over two metres high. It's going to have blossom and berries on that because it's not trimmed. If you trim a hedge hard every single year, it will have no blossom and it will have no berries in, in that year. It's got a few hedgerow trees along it, and that <coughs> we might consider to be an ideal hedge. And just to look at that dynamic that's going on up there is a hedge that's been laid before, but it's been trimmed at the same, it's at a five minute, yes, okay. Uh, and uh, that makes it go down to this, literally in a one to ten scale, that would be number one. And over here we have this good hedge with a nice field margin. If it was neglected, you walked away from it, it would turn into a, this old, decrepit, literally kind of like a line of trees. So, talking about what the hedgerows give us, a review of the services provided in the agri-environment schemes showed that hedgerows could provide 21 ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are, are, are what a habitat gives us. Up here. These services are those that benefit people through the regulation of processes. So these are the regulatory ecosystem services that hedgerows provide. Water quality improvement, flood risk reduction, soil loss, you can read them, crop water availability, on they go. These are the regulatory ecosystem services that hedgerows, and, the, and hedgerows provide the most ecosystem services of any other habitat in the country, our simple little hedgerow. Um, 21 priority bird uh, bat species are associated with hedgerows, and for 13 of these, hedgerows are the primary habitat. 16 out of the 19 birds used by government to assess the state of farmland are in hedgerows, with 10 of them using them as the primary habitat. The cultural services of hedgerows, they define the features of our landscape, as I say, and, and the, the history. I love this bit down here. Their loss, the loss of hedgerows, 
removes much of the cultural and historic patina from the landscape, leaving a blank canvas. And that's very, very true if we let our hedges disappear. One of the main things they can provide is uh, blossom. And at this time, we just had the wild plum come out. We'll have the blackthorn and then the hawthorn coming on. Very important for, for um, invertebrates to feed on. And later on, berries for overwintering birds. And if we trim every year hard at the same height, then we will get no blossom or berries. That's why farmers are paid an amount to trim every second or third year in late winter. And here are the field fairs and the red wings that feed on that vast stock of berries. So hedgerow carbon capture, really quickly. To be honest, the evidence is still not hard and fast. But it's, it's, it's estimated at the moment that 212.3 tonnes of carbon are stored per hectare during the life of a hedgerow. They put it in a hectare, but that actually equates to five kilometres of hedge if the hedge is two metres wide. That is, that is made up of 14.6 tonnes of carbon in the above ground woody material. Worth remembering that because when we chop down a hedge or, or you know, make it regrow, that carbon actually becomes a sustainable fuel source, perhaps of wood. Uh, 30 tonnes of carbon per hectare in below ground woody biomass. Per hectare again is five kilometres. And 133.5 tonnes of carbon, uh, oh, I forget what S, so you can, uh, soil organic carbon um, greater than the adjacent ploughed area. That's the stuff, that's the leaves rotting in the ground, that's all that sort of stuff. Worth remembering, having said that, that the average person's carbon footprint that I could find is about 10 tonnes per year. So there is limited carbon, and that actually goes round in a circle when we, we cut and burn the hedge. So, hedgerows, very, very important. This is in the Chiltern Hills. They define our landscape. We really, really should look up. There's lots of potential, and the hedgerows around Watmington are really pretty poor. Although, at the top of Britwell Hill, a local hedgerow is doing an absolutely fantastic job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so, trees. Um, our heritage and our future. Very important um, to us um, in terms of our environment and our quality of life, uh, products, timber, etc. Um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about carbon storage. Now, in terms of trees, it, there's a lot of variables. You've heard some of what Nigel said about carbon storage in hedges, similar in, in trees, but more importantly, is it in a woodland situation, is the, is the ground conditions that are created by the woodland cover and the soil that's beneath the trees is probably a much more effective carbon sink than the trees themselves. The, the, there's so many variables depending on what the timber crop is that's on there, whether it is harvested as a crop, how long that uh, cycle, the life cycle is, the rotation of that crop, and, and also what the timber is used for as an end product, because all those uh, elements will have an effect on the uh, ability for it to be a uh, carbon sink. Um, now, the, the, this here is a, obviously a, a more permanent tree <laughs> that's had a very long life, and uh, that's just up the top of the hill there. There's a little courtesy to Mr. Barber there for this photograph. But uh, what's quite fascinating about this tree is, is that all the trees that you see in that woodland scene there are actually part of that same tree. And you can see that the branches have layered into the ground, and all these stems are actually part of that same tree. And it's now got to the stage where these stems themselves are starting to layer, and, and you've got the next generation coming up. So the, that one tree is about 50 metres in diameter, which is quite spectacular. What kind of tree? It's a lime tree, a small leaf lime tree. So yes, it's the longevity of trees is, is very important. What, what I want you to take home, if anything, today is, is that um, when you're considering planting a tree, it should be a well-considered sort of strategic approach to planting trees. And we'll touch on some of the um, perhaps not so well thought through elements of tree planting in, in a moment. But um, the, the message is just, just really think about it and plan uh, what you want to do before you rush into, into tree planting. And if you think about tree planting, it's probably the most long-term thing you will ever do. It's, it's more long term than buying a house, it's more long term than planning a family. If you plant a tree, it's there for potentially hundreds of years. So it, it's not something we should be um, uh, rushing into without a, a lot of thought. 
Okay, so I've been in the industry for 40 years. Uh, you've heard the introduction, so I won't run on that. But in addition to earning a living as an arboricultural consultant, uh, I'm also associated with a, a couple of other organisations. Um, this is the Trees and Design Action Group. They uh, produce best pr practice guidance documents to mainly to um, uh, secure the, the establishment and uh, longevity of trees in the urban realm. And I will, most of my work is associated with uh, the, the uh, urban trees and <coughs> urban treescapes and this presentation will reflect that a little bit. One of the best practice guidance documents that was produced recently, well, back in 2014 actually, but uh, is, is this document. All the documents that TDAG produce are available free, free to download on their website and can be a, a form of, of some substantial information. So I uh, um, recommend those to you. Uh, in addition to TDAG, I'm a trustee uh, treasurer for Fund for Trees. Fund for Trees is a charity that raises money from funds for uh, research into tree-related subjects and also uh, implements community events and education for children and, and community groups. Um, you can see there we're with Sadiq Khan, and that was outside the mayor's office. Just before we set off for Paris, we cycled to Paris to take the document you've just seen, which was translated into French, for the, for the French, and we, we cycled to the, mayor, to the Mayor's Congress in, in Paris to deliver that document. And you can see that we also took a little oak tree um, from Windsor Great Park, which my colleague there ca carried in his pannier. <laughs> <laughs> so we're e exporting oaks to, to France, which is quite an impressive thing. So one of the, the children are just so rewarding. When you're doing events like that, they love planting trees, but they, this is... Uh, we get them to chat to, to force energy into the tree to make it grow, and they're all screaming, grow tree, grow, there at the end of the planting session. And uh, there's great enthusiasm. But it's always so rewarding that these kids know more than most of us about the benefits of trees and the, and the environmental good that they can do. So it's, it's always very satisfying to, to do these events. But um, what we have realised more recently is that it, it, the tree planting is in vogue. It's you know, with all the politically driven, um, numbers orientated tree planting initiatives that are kicking around. That's all good, but what we really need to secure is the longevity of those trees to ensure that the reason they're going in the ground is actually achieved, the benefits are realised. And um, so, what we've done more recently is uh, do rides where we we then call in at community groups and, tr and schools and talk to them about and get them involved with the ma basic maintenance of, of young trees, making sure that they do uh, establish and thrive. Okay, so if we want to plant trees, I'm sure we're all very enthusiastic to want to plant, plant trees, so we've got to, what we want to do is, is really consider it, as I said earlier, and the things that we want to look at is why are we planting the tree? Let's have a look at the objectives. What do we want that tree to do for us? And if, we're going, if, we, if, if we identify those, we'll then know what we need to plant and, and what provision we need to make in order for those uh, objectives to be realised. Where to put it is obviously uh, very important, but uh, again, it needs to be designed in to the landscape, into the urban realm or the setting that it's put in. Five minutes, right? So, uh, so how do we do that? Um, there's all sorts of uh, things that we can look at, and we'll touch on a couple of those in a minute. And, and then, obviously, what we're going to plant. Now, I haven't got time for that this evening, so I'm going to uh, rattle on onto the other things. So why, then? Why is this tree planted? Anybody know what, that's, what, what that tree is? The, the, not the experts. A sequoia. A sequoia. So it's, it's a sequoia dendron giganteum. The clue's in the name. Right, that's the largest living plant on the on the planet, and yet someone chose to put it in a pot. <laughs> okay, now that's also a sequoia, and a, and a very happy tree geek at the bottom of it. But what 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 we've got to realise is that someone not only did someone think it was a good idea to put that into a pot, someone else approved that design, and someone else funded it, 
and, and we've really got to challenge that sort of uh, uh, operation. Here's another example. This is a London plane. London plane capable of 30 metres in height, 20 odd metres in span, and it's just going nowhere. That poor tree has nothing. So it's, there's no vision there as to what, what, why that tree was put in. There's no provision for it to establish above or below ground, and I suggest it has no chance. So we really do need to think. And then where are we going to put the tree? <laughs> That's perhaps a little bit innovative. And I, I, I just thought this evening that perhaps uh, those trees are self-isolating because it's in northern Italy. <laughs> But what, what, what we do want to do is ensure that when we're looking at where trees go, we've got to look at what's, what's going on around them. So a large canopy tree can, be, can create shade and a pleasant area to sit. The, the street trees perhaps have to be more columnar in their form and, they, and they, they can deliver all sorts of benefits, some of which, again, Nigel mentioned, um, that are useful to us in, the, in a built environment. Um, the gorilla planting, so I'm familiar with the term probably that gorilla planting where trees are just randomly put in the ground and uh, the, there's been a couple of mentions of the thousand trees that were planted in Watlington. Now to an extent that was gorilla planting and I'm afraid that some of them fell on stony ground and are no longer with us. Some of them have been, have been looked after and, uh, um, and they're thriving and uh, as you won't come into Watlington that, look, that looks super. But um, some of them are now quite a, a, a problem for the parish um, in terms of management and a bit of a burden. So we really need to stop, think, plan, and then question whether we should be planting or whether we should be uh, thinking of other ways of achieving the benefits. There's another example of... We can give trees a very bad name if we put them in the wrong place and they start to destroy the other infrastructure that we rely on. So it really does need to be thought through. So there's a happy tree. There's a tree growing in a natural environment. It's got lots of soil and lots of space to do what it needs to do. Um, and how can we replicate that in the built environment? If we consider that that's a sort of suggestion of the amount of roots that would be attached to a tree with that canopy size, we can realise how difficult that is to achieve that in the urban realm. So it's recognising opportunities. Car parks are great opportunities. You may recognise this location. This is Henley on Thames. That's the Waitrose uh, supermarket. And this was a car park where the trees that were planted there 20 years ago were really just sitting there doing... If they'd survived at all, they were doing very little and they weren't contributing in any way to the aesthetics or the environment of that, of that area. So um, we looked at uh, provide, taking those out and make putting less trees back in, but making, giving provision for those trees to thrive in that, in that environment. So we got a larger species of tree, bigger canopy. We didn't lose any car parking spaces, um, but we used different technologies to, to, to secure l large volumes of soil beneath the car park that the tree can thrive in and that uh, could also be used for stormwater management, so you get multi-purpose green infrastructure. Okay, thanks. So what we say, this is an expensive way to plant trees, but if you just put it in a, in a hole in the ground, like we saw the other plane tree, where it's going to cause a lot of damage, and you're really throwing good money after bad if you're trying to, uh, uh, to do that. So what we're saying is, is less trees with adequate provision to ensure their longevity and to ensure that they deliver the objectives that you've chosen for, uh, that, you've, that you've identified for putting them in the ground. Okay, that's that, that tree now, um, in desperate need of a bit of gentle pruning, crown lifting, but it, 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 they are thriving. There's two, two planes in the, in the Henley Car Park, you'll see them if you go out that way. Okay, so species selection, as I said, I haven't really got time for that t this evening. But uh, my suggestion is diversity is the key to resilience, and I'd like you to take that message home. Native species have their merits. I think we've, we've got to really consider what, uh, how much we use native species and how much we can encourage other species as well, given the climate change pressures and uh, pest and disease that are coming into our, 
our, our, our environment. And uh, that's all from me. Thanks. <laughs>